We're all excited as we start out on our canoe trip. I am ready for adventure. This seven week chain is filled with beautiful beaches, pristine crystal clear waters, thick forests with paths intertwining throughout. That first night, after a long day of canoeing, we're all sitting around a campfire, relaxing. The smell of smoke and roasting marshmallows is thick in the air. Suddenly, we hear yelling, bear, bear, bear. One of our team members, we Ricky Little, has gone to the outhouse. He comes face to face with a huge 10 foot bear. <laughs> the bear roars as we Ricky leans down and scrabbles through the bear's legs. Some people are diving for cover. Others are trying to hide behind the trees. Suddenly, there is thrashing and crashing from my left. I have Wee Ricky and the bear to my right. I look left. I look right. I look left again. And from the left, a huge bull moose comes thundering out of the tall thicket. <laughs> Time seems to stand still, and everything is quiet. One moment later, time seems to speed up all at once, like I press a fast forward button on my old VCR. I am caught between the moose, Wee Ricky, and that bear. <laughs> this is where everything kicks in. My moose train from my childhood in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> Just what to do. I run over to that moose, I leave left, I grab that moose by his antler, and I catapult myself up onto his back. <laughs> <laughs> My hands are still sticky from those sticky, licky, gooey, gooey, nummy, yummy s'mores that we've been enjoying around the campfire. All the better to grab that moose with. <laughs> Well, we are ready to get started, and Sue is going to go ahead and start our slideshow. I hope you guys enjoyed that example of one of my earliest tall tales that I ever gave. Well, what is a tall tale? A tall tale is truly a story with unbelievable elements related as if they were true and factual. You can even ride a moose in the Canadian outback. Some tall tales are definite exaggerations and others are completely fictional, but they might have a familiar setting. Events are often told in a way that makes the narrator seem to have been part of that story. Let's go to the next slide. And there's something there to be said about that, Colette, because just exactly how exaggerated can things be? Well, think exaggerate 
the exaggeration. Yes. An example. You've heard of raining cats and dogs. That's an exaggeration. But what if it rained so hard you had to swim to work? I know that in hurricanes, people have had to take boats to work. But that's a different kind of exaggeration because that was actually true. <laughs> Ever heard of a pun? I knew a guy who was addicted to brake fluid. But he told me he could stop anytime. <laughs> and then, of course... There's one too funny. Darren LaCroix is great with one too funny. You notice I'm wearing this orange. A lot of you know the story of the orange. But do you realize that on game day, orange is a great color to wear. And then on Sunday, orange is great when you need to go hunting because you want to be sure to wear safety orange. And Monday through Friday, orange is great when you're picking up trash on the highway. And of course, try irony. Irony is, okay, there's a fire at the fire station. Who's gonna put it out? Or somebody broke into the police station and robbed it. These are all forms of exaggeration. And exaggeration is simply taking it to another level, but at the same time, having a certain degree of believability. Now, writing tips come in many, many forms. Some people are great at writing outlines. Some people are great at writing an entire speech. It doesn't matter, but there are components in a tall tale that you need to have. First of all, you always want to have a character with a specific goal in mind. This is important because there's going to be some kind of conflict that has to be overcome. Like, for example, how do you deal with a 10-foot bear in the camp when you're making s'mores? Simple. You ride a bull moose. On the other hand, uh, the true. hero's journey to the victory is a big, big deal, but there's going to always be along the journey to victory those unexpected twists and turns and surprises. And for the audience, you're on the edge of your seat because the suspense is absolutely delighting you. I personally love a great tall tale. And like John alluded to, there's some key elements. And if you can remember these things, you'll be well on your way to quickly creating your own tall tale. You need the main character. They have to have an ability, whether that's riding a moose or tackling a bear. It doesn't matter what that ability is they can use it to solve the problem. And your problem is the climax. You also have to have an antagonist. Now, in my story, the antagonist was the bear. And then you have to have a great solution mm -hmm. and conclusion, perhaps maybe a message for your audience. Yeah. What we have up here, is our Tall Tales worksheet. And I want you to pay close attention to this because we are going to use this tonight. It's going to be very exciting. You're going to use this to practice developing your own Tall Tale on the fly. So start thinking. You want to think about your plot. The Tall Tale follows a plot. It has rising action, a climax, problem, and resolution. Many times they're based on a true story, and those are my favorite kinds of tall tales. Whether the beginning is true and you drive it off the rails, or you stretch the truth in a normal everyday story. The elements, of course, your main character your, is your hero. You have exaggeration, like John said. You solve a problem, descriptive language, vivid verbs, all of these things help you connect with your audience. Now, your main character, who are they? What do they need to do? What problem do they have? And what is their ability? Their cri the crisis is your climax. So keep that in mind. And finally, your resolution. What is the resolution? And perhaps leave your audience with a lesson learned. Do you have any tips on this, John? Well, one of the things that I want to point out 
is first of all, don't go and make the mistake of copying somebody else's story. Mm -hmm. There is this thing about telling a tall tale that you simply take something that you've read before or been told before, and it's widely publicized. My friends, we're Toastmasters. We subscribe to the idea of originality. Yes, originality can be completely fictional, but it can also have an element of believability. But nobody's going to listen to you if you're going to borrow somebody else's material. You need to create your own design. And you need to be able to have fun while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. I kind of like to call it the safety cone principle. Stay away from things that are widely known, widely published, and everybody knows that story. Yeah. The second thing is don't be afraid to roll the dice and take a chance. Yeah. But the most important thing that you can do is don't be so serious. Yeah. Have fun. But don't be childish, please. As a matter of fact, Akeem Bennett is here tonight. And Akeem has to keep his mic muted because he's got a child that likes to make a lot of noise. Isn't that a great sound? Have fun. But don't be too adult either. Nobody likes a stodgy tall tale teller. Hey, that's pretty good. <laughs> but remember this. Again and again, remind yourself, you want exaggerated believability exaggerated believability so much so that at the end of the tall tale, when you hit them with a punchline, they're going to realize you've been yanking on their leg the entire time and all for the fun of telling a perfectly great story, whether it's true, false, or eh, somewhere in between. <laughs> Let's play. Who's ready to play? I know I am. I, I am love creating a tall tale. Now, here's what we're going to do. Sue is going to drop that worksheet into chat. We're also going to leave that worksheet up on the screen. And Sue is going to give us five minutes mm -hmm. five minutes and at the end of five minutes john and i are going to have fun with you guys we're going to take turns calling on people and you folks are going to get a chance to stand and deliver so sue if we could go ahead and start our time perhaps either sue or vicky so that we can have the Green at three, yellow at four, and red at five. I can't wait to see some of the tall tales that come out of this. Drop any questions in chat as you're working on this, okay? Remember, as you're thinking, always come up with something that you can find relatable either related to something you've experienced or relatable to something that you know or someone you know that they've experienced and you've had the opportunity to share that story with them. But remember, originality is an important component in the process. And you wanna be sure that you've got on your play cap. And sometimes that means wearing more than just one cap, if you get my drift. I'm going to tell you a secret. Colette sent me a message in chat, a private message. She wanted to know how it went. My response is, what are you talking about? All right, what? everyone, your five minutes is up. Oh my goodness, that went really fast, didn't it? Yeah. It goes fast. Are you ready to play? I know everybody's probably thinking, oh, please don't call on me first. Don't call on me first. <laughs> but I know someone to in the room. To be quite honest with you, I couldn't find it in the chat till about two minutes after you oh. said that it was in there. So I didn't quite finish it, but. 
Well, that's okay, Teresa. Thank you, Terry, because because you have been great at telling tall tales for years. You worked for Disney, and Disney is the tell of many tales. So what did you start with? Can you give me an idea of who you oh, yes, was and what the problem can. was? I was out in my backyard, and I have this huge retention pond. Uh -huh. One day, this huge alligator just comes out of the water. Sounds like Florida. And what do I do? I started to run, but this big man came out from down the street. He had a yellow hat on that was one yard wide, and he had a gun and a net. And you know what he was? I was so lucky. He was an alligator hunter. Ah. And he was amazing. He just went right in there like it was easy. I couldn't believe my eyes the way he handled the alligator. He just swooped it up in his net and this alligator that was like eight feet long could have killed me. And he could have killed all the little birds that are in the pond. I was so lucky. I don't know how that alligator got in that pond because it's kind of closed off. Uh -huh. But I was so lucky and I'm still alive today. Yes, you are. And you were alive to tell that story and live to tell it, no less. Hey, that kind of reminds me of a story that happened to me when I went fishing in Texas, because I was with some of my friends and we were out there on the boat and I caught this fish and I was determined to catch it because I thought, what a great catch. And wouldn't you know it, they told me you can't keep that fish because it's not big enough to fit what they require as far as Game and Fish Commission is concerned. So you're going to have to toss it back in. So I had to wait until three friends came by to help me throw it back in. You know, that's how things are in Texas. <laughs> Who should we pick on next? Who do you think, John? Who's on, who's on deck here? Well, there's a lot of people there looking with smiles on their face and they have a sheepish look. But I happen to see Sandy Murphy. And Sandy is always great with a yarn. So Sandy... Tell us a little bit about your possible tall tale. Hit us with your story, Sandy. I really need to be in costume to do this story because it's about my grandmother who lived in South Texas. And she went over to see her aunt and her cousin. And it's thrilling for a little kid to go to South Texas because they still have what they call, well, they it's not called, it is. It's a pool string toilet. The tank is not behind the toilet, it's up on the ceiling and up on the wall close to the ceiling. And after you do your business, you always have to remember. My grandmother said, now Sandy, you always remember to pull the string. And I pull that string and that water comes gushing down that pipe and to flush that toilet. <laughs> and, my, and my aunt, she still had a snuff box and my cousin, she still made her own homemade cigarettes because <sighs> that's what they did in the 1800s. And, my aunt, she liked to stay with the old, old, old timey habits. Well, they were sitting on the front porch when we drove up. And my grandmother said, now y'all just stay there. I'm going to go in and I'm going to get some iced tea. And I, I, Lucille jumped up. She said, you can't go in there. We got a, we got a snake. We got a big snake in there. My grandmother said, well, well, does it have black and red and yellow bands on it? And they said, no, no bands, no color. Then she said, well, what, what, what about the color of a, of a copper tea kettle? No, 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 no copper tea kettle color. Well, what about a rattle and diamond patterns on his back? No, we know what a Texas rattlesnake looks like. Then my grandmother said, well, is it dark green and brownish color? And they said, yeah, that's it. And it's big. And my grandmother said, you got yourself a big old Texas water moccasin in your house. <laughs> well, they like water. You probably got a water leak in there somewhere. My grandmother, she took a pistol out of her purse and she took some bullets out of her purse and she loaded up their pistol. I didn't know that my grandmother carried a pistol till that moment. She went in the house and she creaked around and she was looking and looking and we didn't hear anything. 
pretty soon we heard the chickens out back. They were just squawking away. We run out there. Oh my goodness, they didn't think the chickens were, the devil was after the chickens. We couldn't figure out what it was. And then, ah, oh, we saw this slinky, 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 dark brownish. It was slithering and slithering and slithering. It was, a, it was the water moccasin slithering for the, slithering for all the chicken eggs in the kid chicken poop. My grandmother, she took her gun and she just unloaded those bullets right there on that snake. And it went straight up and then it came straight down and then it slithered around and it twisted all around. And then it was flat as a Texas pancake on a hot summer day. That snake was gone. She went out there, she got the shovel by the chick coop. And she went out in the backyard and she dug that snitch and she put that, she put that snake in there real good and she covered it up on the way home. After we got home, my grandmother said, now, Sandy, you just go into the ice box over there and you get yourself a cold glass of milk. And then she says, I'm going to have a cold gin and tonic because I know cold gin and tonics are good for the arthritis of my hands and I need them to work my pistol. Now, you're thinking that this is a tall tale, but everything that I told you is true. Now, there was one other time that my grandmother, that pistol in her purse came out really handy. Well, that's another story and another true, tall, South Texas tale. Yay! <laughs> Way to go, Sandy! Sandy, you have to compete in the Tall Tales contest. There you go. Your dialogue was amazing. It was. That was <laughs> exceptional. Thank you. John, yes. I I think I see Adrian Dixon. She is giggling and uh, laughing. She sure is, and Adrian's got that gorgeous smile on her face. I think Which Adrian needs Adrian to share to... her tall tale. You got it, Adrian. Are you up for it? Come on, Adrian. Turn your mic on. Give it a go. Yay! Okay, tall tale. In life, we have to do and make so many choices. Mm -hmm. Now, I was proposed to. Then we went to the beach. My lovely fiance and I, and he asked me, how many kids do you want? And I said, <laughs> and I asked him, how many kids does he want? And he says, three. I was like, good enough, that's a lot of kids. And he told me his mother had three. And I looked at him and I said, I love your mother so much. So I politely stood up in my cute little Victoria's Secrets bikini. And I said, do you see three popping out of here? He goes, well, my mommy did. I was like, I love your mother so much. Look at your mom, look at mine. Don't see three. He's like, well, you know what, dear? Here's what you need to know. You have the babies and you'll go back. As soon as you pop one out, you'll go back to being small again. I was like, who told you that lie? Don't lie to me. We're about to get married. Lie to me. He goes, no, that's what happens with the ladies. They have the baby and then they're back. And I just looked at him. I was like, I know. You are a walking brain. But that right there, I, I don't see that. I don't. I was like, you know what, dear? I love you so much. And the joy of having a marriage, I'll make a compromise. He's like, what? I get three? I was like, oh, no. No way, no how. How about I compromise to one? How is that a compromise? I was like, zero is huge. Three? That's mega. But no. So, one. He's like, okay, well, we'll talk about that. I was like, here, try this. One shot, and I'm done. So, maybe you can pop out twins with me. I was like, I don't have twins on my side. I was like, I have twins on mine. He was like, no, no, you don't. I haven't seen them. I was like, well, ask my mother. She'll tell you there's a lot. I was like, or maybe yeah, you might pop out three in that one shot. He's looking at me like, I mean, you're not that big. I was like, you know what? Maybe I don't know what they call it with four or even whence. You know, you never know. 
you can dream big. And I could be that cute Aki mom. He looked at me like, huh? Where do you see eight popping out? I was like, well, you saw three popping out, so dream big. And that was just an interesting time at the beach. <laughs> and I told him, you know, you never, ever, ever know. And I politely told him, I was like, listen, you marry, or you're about to marry, the cheerleader, the college cheerleader. And you're dreaming big because you were that really smart. As some would say, the geek. So beauty in the geek. See, you dream big and you got me. Therefore, dream big. I might be that happy mom, the cute happy mom. He was like, no, no way, no how. It's like, well, <laughs> you wanted it. So three, that, that's huge. I don't see that not happening. But you never, ever, ever know. One shot, you might make eight. You the happy mom, the cute happy mom. See, how many of you guys can say they marry the... The college sweetheart, the cheerleader, she was homecoming court, and she wasn't a hoe. And how many how many guys can say that? They, they really can't. Therefore, dream big. It can happen. Hopefully it doesn't. <clears throat> I already said if I was gonna have kids, I wanted to be the hot mama. So as you can see, dream big. You never ever know. And I had one, and I'm still that hot mama. Mr. Toastmaster. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell you right now, there's a pun in there because <laughs> you were talking about a homecoming queen and not a hoe. <laughs> so that could, be a, that could be a hoe coming queen. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. See? Oh, oh, my, my goodness. goodness. Good one. Good one. Thank you, Adrian. Well, Did John. A little bit? Did I count a little bit? Who's calling my name? I don't know. Oh, I am, John. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I, Go we, ahead. Still, we still have time for more. Can you believe it? Yeah, I believe that. Because who, who, should we, who should we pick on next? Well, let me see. Da, 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 da. Oh, I see I Andy. Big, I see Sabrina. I got a big screen TV right here I'm looking at, and I'm trying to see who's on it. Oh, okay. So any, 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 oh Charles has his hand up. Charles. Yeah, Charles is a brand new Toastmaster. Way to go, Charles. And he's got the greatest name, Beauregard. <laughs> well, y'all ain't going to believe this. It happened a long time ago when I was a teenager of some age, probably about 13. My friends are three up or three down from that. We had three ATVs between us. But we uh, only had one that was working. It was mine. It was a 250cc machine. And we decided after a very wet, rainy, and boring Sunday morning, we would go into the woods. And we did. All three of us on one vehicle. Uh, probably about at the time, I'd reckon since none of us were light, about 600 pounds of weight on that 250cc ATV. And we're going, we're tromping through the woods, and, uh, well, we find a mud pit. But we do not recognize it's a mud pit. It kind of looks like something we can cross, but we don't know if we can cross it. And ain't none of us thinking of that we got 600 pounds of weight on a 200-pound ATV. So, we get stuck. Oh. And first, one of us unloads from the vehicle. Because that's the only choice they had. Because when we stopped, they fell off. So they get off and they get out. And then I'm in the middle, so I get out. And I try and look, and are we stuck or not? And then, of course, the biggest kid gets off. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to walk, trying not to get muddy. We've all got eight-inch boots on. You know, we've got hunting gear. So it can be washed. It can be cleaned. You know, we can be hosed off pretty easy. But suffice to say, we had covered him uh, head to toe and we are just covered in mud the four-wheeler is covered in mud almost to the tailpipe thankfully the tailpipe wasn't covered so uh we know we can't move it with three of us on it 
and we try and pull it, and well, that goes about as well as you'd expect in mud. And uh, if we could possibly get more mud on us by now, it's done. We finally, uh, we figured out, we popped it in reverse, geared it up, and one of us rode on the side and got it out of the pit. Then we raced home to my parents' house because we had been bogged down for about an hour. And, of course, uh, they saw, they heard us coming, and they looked, and, of course, they're rolling on the floor laughing. And, you know, just, just seeing three kids in the formula covered in mud, and, of course, uh, we get hosed off. And, uh, you know, it's just, you know, it's just a disaster. Now, me and the second oldest boy, we don't get in trouble. We're okay, because we ain't got anything else to do Sunday. The poor youngest kid, though, got his hide hand, as far as I can tell, because he was still soaping wet from all the mud. Now, all the mud was gone. Every nook and cranny of the mud was gone, but he was still soaping up. Yeah, you know, just just soaking wet, and his parents, uh, especially his mother, could not abide that. And yeah, that was the last time we went into the woods together on one ATV. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Charles. Way to be brave and step up. Well done, sir. I'd like to do something if we could, Colette. We yes, sir. are doing great with time and we've got some folks thinking and I think we have some more potential volunteers and voluntold ease as well. But I think it would be a good time to just for a few moments here, throw open a little bit of Q&A and let some of the folks out there ask questions. And I particularly want to hear questions from some specific individuals. For example, Kathy Jorgensen. I happen to like Kathy when it comes to being connected to things and observant, and she's very intentional about being connected. But Kathy, do you have a particular question or do you have some degree of doubt as to whether or not you could actually spin a tall tale? <laughs> That's a very good question. I. I love putting on the contests and I love hearing the stories. I, I don't know. I don't know. All right. Kathy. I don't have an answer, but thank let's, you for asking that question and putting me on the spot. Let's play a game. Let's play a game here. You and me. All right. Okay. Kathy, what is one of the things that you love to do in your free time? Dinosaur hunting. All righty. Now, do you look for dinosaur bones or actually, or are you still looking for Jurassic Park? No, actually, it's the eggs. My dad oh. found a femur one time. We were just fishing. We were in Alaska and he found a femur one time and that got me interested. All right. Kathy, was... that is a tall tale. Yes. Right so, yeah. <laughs> where, where do you go to look? For dinosaur bones and other kinds of things, and dinosaur eggs. Well, after that one time, and we sort of went through a process trying to get it analyzed and all that kind of stuff, uh -huh. and no one was really interested. So I, I was rather disenchanted after that. And so I never really pursued it. Are you telling me that you don't look for dinosaur bones anymore? Not anymore. I know not anymore because I mean, we're here in Florida. They're all going to be alligator bones and all of that kind of stuff now. <laughs> and when all of these snakes and everything, you know, I'm sure that the animals have gotten them. And I'm actually waiting for the lake to go down about three or four feet before we start looking. No doubt they probably are here somewhere. Kathy, I'd like to piggyback on you. I think if you go to Lakeland right behind of John, you will, <laughs> you will find what you're looking for. Oh, yeah, like <laughs> okay, we're moving. We don't call them sinkhole lakes for nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John, for that question. All righty. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to toss out there about Perhaps maybe the parameters and the at the same time, if there are limitations, what are those limitations involved? And on the other hand, 
is there really such thing as a limitation or is it just purely a case of, you know, having a chance to be extraordinarily creative using something that has some be believability built into it? Any questions? Somebody raise a hand or open up your mic. Uh, I, I have a question. For, I have a question. The tall tale used to be four to six minutes. And now I, I see in the rule book, they've changed it to three to five. And I just wonder what happened. That is uh, correct, Sandy. It's three to five minutes. And for the last several years that we've been doing tall tales, and they keep that tall tales criteria, by the way, in the rule book, Sandy, which is what I like. I don't know just exactly what year it was that they made that adjustment, but I know that sometime in my Toastmasters lifetime, they decided to change that, but not that many people paid attention to it. And the truth is, from a competitive point of view, three to five is what they want to have. However, from a club point of view, if you wanted to have a tall tale contest and it was a non tall tale year, you could make that tall tale any length you want to make it. Make it four to six, make it five to seven. There's all kinds of flexibility there, but you're correct when you say it is three to five. So three to five falls there in that sweet spot between a table topic and a five to seven minute speech. And that's a place mm -hmm. where you can really create a great idea, a concept. You can find your hero. You can find your journey. You can find your, your crisis, your, your protagonist, your opponent in the situation. And then you can find the problem-solving solution and the victory on the road and everything. Other questions? John, Judy, yeah. uh, Julie Sago has her hand up there for Judy, you. Judy, Julie. Yeah, 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 yeah. I have a question. Number one, actually, it's two questions. Number one, what is the purpose of tall tale competition? And the second thing is what John already mentioned, are there any limitations what we shouldn't address? All right, uh, Colette, what would you yes. say based upon your experience because you've been doing tall tales as I have, what do you find about tall tales that makes it such a useful and purposeful competition and opportunity as far as speaking is concerned. I really enjoy the tall tale, first of all, because it's simply so much fun. You can take the everyday, like a canoe trip, or trying to put your grandkid to bed and having mm -hmm. a struggle. And you can take those stories and you can make them unbelievable and still have a story and a message it it just is a big chance to practice your writing your creativity and your delivery you can have props i've taken the stage in my pajamas my house coat swim goggles and a super soaker <laughs> that's right ladies and gentlemen you can make it as big and bad as you want and practice that because it I feel like it gives you skills and a different connection with your audience that can be used in other types of competition for example the evaluation and the international speech contests because all of these little pieces though the tall tale is super exaggerated and unbelievable at times you still need the essence of that connection that storytelling anytime you take the stage. And this is just a great way to practice getting outside of your comfort zone. So you are actually trying to entertain the audience or Absolutely. what? Absolutely. 100%. Ah. Absolutely. And in terms of what would be the, for want of a better term, uh, the taboo part of it, the off limits part of it, we as Toastmasters understand the core values and we understand the mission of the club. And so it's very important for us anytime we speak in any type of a situation, whether it's a serious subject or whether it's a reflective subject or whether it's an abstract subject, whatever the subject might be, we always are mindful of the fact that the audience needs to be placed in a situation where they're not going to be personally offended. So you yeah. want to always keep that in mind because there are certain places you just simply don't go. We are an organization that has an international flavor. And one of the great things about a Tall Tales contest is that it lends itself to an international flavor because the stories that you hear coming out of cultures that are not indigenous to this country, I mean, Julie, you have stories, your life is rich 
with stories. Mm -hmm. And you could take a basic story growing up as a child and you could embellish that story and exaggerate yeah. it. And we would be eating out of your hand. But it would be a story about you right. and about people that you connect with and we would connect with you and we would be entertained by you. So I am mm -hmm. a firm believer that a tall tale is something everybody can do and that we mm -hmm. are Toastmasters and we respect one another and we know what to stay away from and mm -hmm. what we need to focus our attention on. But thank you. That was a dynamite question. It was a good It question. was. John, Sabrina has her hand up. And then maybe when we answer this question, we can close out with one last one, tall tale. One, what one, do you one, say? One, I agree. I'm with you on that. All right. Miss Sabrina, ask your well, question. Colette, can you give us some very famous tall tales and that was done in the past. What are some of the famous ones that you so could think like? Paul Bunyan? Everybody mm -hmm. knows the story of Paul Bunyan. That's probably the most famous tall tale out there. If you need a bar, I'm sure you can YouTube Paul Bunyan and put your finger on the pulse of it. He was technically a true character that was completely embellished and he became a hero and he became 10 feet tall and could clear forests in a fell swoop and he made an impact so that's probably the one that jumps to my mind the most very first is the Paul Bunyan tall tale yeah, thank you. I wanted you to share that because you have Johnny Appleseed. Those are yep. all tall tales. Mm -hmm. uh, Pecos Bill. Those are all tall tales. Even mm -hmm. Calamity And Jane, I see Vicky posted uh, one in there. Jo Dave Crockett, Davy Crockett. Mm -hmm. Those are all tall tales. I just wanted to I, give the audience an idea of some of the tall tales that we we have read. I, I sang the Davy Crockett song. <laughs> Born in the mountaintop of Tennessee, fiercest name in the land of the free. Killed him a bear when he was only three. Davy, Davy Crockett, king of the wild frontier. That's right. Uh -huh. See, uh -uh. I still well, channel that hillbilly. But now, do what we brave have... person is going to close us out with the tall tale, John? Do we need to appoint someone or is there someone? Oh, I don't know. Is willing? anybody itching? If you're itching, to close us out with a tall tale. I would Oh, ask Vicky. All right. Yes, yes. The yes, stage is yes. yours, Vicky Goodman. Well, friends, I'm here to tell you a story that happened, well, quite a few years ago, quite a few years ago. It was in that great state of Alaska where a young girl used to travel with her father. They lived up there for a while. And then we're in the far north part of Alaska where it was really cold and freezing. Her name was Kathy and her father, Mr. Jorgensen, <laughs> would take her out on his trips, looking around. He was kind of a geology nut and they would go out and they would explore all the various aspects of the Alaskan Northwest. Kathy was very fascinated with it, especially because they would go into these caves and they would start looking around. Her father was really interested in dinosaurs and prehistoric things. And he was looking for bones and those sorts of fossils. He would find them and teach her about them. But she found one time this really round, ovaly thing. And her father said, you know, I think that's a dinosaur egg. And that's exactly what it was. She was fascinated with that. It was a dinosaur egg, of course, petrified, but she was there. She started a lifelong hobby of collecting dinosaur eggs all over Alaska. She was digging in the snow, digging way down. And one time she found several really frozen solid in the ice and she would take them home because I guess people weren't that interested and she put them in a little basket. And then one day she went home and she looked in her basket and do you know that there was an egg missing in that basket? There was an egg missing in the basket. What, what could have happened? Did someone break into her house? All of a sudden she turned and she heard a noise 
and they're skittering across the floor was a baby dinosaur. That egg had broken and there was a dinosaur running around the house. Of course, it was little and cute and she didn't want her parents to take it away from her. So she kept it in the closet with all of her stuffed animals. And that's where she kept that dinosaur. And she would feed it little tidbits. But you and I both know dinosaurs are not necessarily small critters. In fact, they tend to be a bit large. And as time went on, that dinosaur grew and grew and grew. And she had no idea how to hide it any longer. In fact, her father came in the house one day and said, what the heck is that sound? And what was that smell that I, I had smell? He went into her room and there was this gigantic dinosaur almost filled the entire room. And he said, we have to get rid of this right away. Well, Kathy was having no part of that. This was her friend, her pal, her little green friend. She jumped on the back of that dinosaur and just stampeded right past her father, went oh. all the way out and took them out they were still living in alaska and went up to the snow where she found a cave and she put her little di- her big dinosaur in that cave at that time and to this day kathy goes to visit that dinosaur friend of hers and she won't <laughs> tell anybody where it is because she knows that her dad or his friends are out to get it because they want the bones they want the fossils and she's going to have none of that <laughs> Yeah. Well done. I love well, it. It looks like we're almost out of time here, John. I did want to mention one thing, if that's okay. Please do. As you're crafting your tall tales, I want each of you to consider competing if you're mm-hmm. eligible to compete. It just ups your game. And with every competition, we know that there's a judge's criteria. There's the judge's ballot, and this is a good tool for you to look at the parameters that they will be looking for. And if Sue doesn't mind dropping the uh, judge's ballot in the chat, I think that this is a tool. You'll be able to download it and refer to it Uh, along with the worksheet that we dropped in the chat. I think those two tools will certainly help you get well on your way and I don't know about you John but I love a good tall tale and everybody here today was so brave to share and hopefully you found all the tips and tools that we gave you give you some confidence to dip your toes in the water what do you think John Colette, I just want, and John, I want to thank you, first of all. I'm an area director, so I can't be in a contest, but I was here really to tell my people that are in other clubs about the Tall Tale because they have no idea what it is. Mm-hmm. So uh, thank you for informing me. The slides were wonderful. I found out it's three to five minutes. I'm sorry, I was not longer, but uh, thank you so much for all the information. And we will wrap up with this. As you know, we're talking about speech preparation and we are coming into the speech season for club level activities. You can have your club contest in any way, form, shape or fashion you wish. And the three contests that we will be taking all the way to district will be, of course, international, which goes to a world championship. Mm -hmm. But there'll also be the evaluation contest and tall tales this year. And although we sprung it on you a bit on surprise, it's not as if it's not been around. It has But what we hope you'll do is remember between October the 1st and December the 31st, this is the time for you to ramp up that club contest, get those contests going. And not only that, but talk it up and get people to be involved because if they love table topics and they love creative thinking and they like imaginative ideas to put to some form of vocabulary and make it into a presentation piece that's entertaining and within the three to five minute window, you've got yourself a contest. And you right. need to make that a showcase. And as a matter of fact, can I make one more suggestion? Have your tall tales at an open house. There you go. I've done that before, John. It is very successful. I'll give you one more. I challenge you if you're in charge of 
getting your club contest together and scheduling it. Give yourself two weeks, get it on the books, leave yourself plenty of time to plan and encourage those in your club to compete. Sometimes it can take a little time, so don't wait. <laughs>